Uh, excited to talk to the group today. Uh, I have a lot to talk about. Um, the topic of my, my presentation here is going to be on battery energy storage, that best uh, term that we, we so often hear. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges with battery energy storage, in particular, keeping workers safe around uh, battery energy storage facilities from arc flash danger. Uh, so just a little bit about me before we get started. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. Um, I've been doing a, a ton of work here in the renewable space here as of late, um, especially when it comes to battery energy storage and, and renewables. And uh, a lot of the studies that we do are related to new installations and design. So we're actively out working on projects that are being built right now, kind of building this renewable grid of tomorrow. And um, uh, one of the challenges that we're seeing is in the art class space. So I've been working on art flash for quite a long time, most of my career. And, you know, we started back in the early 2000s with art flash, you know, really kind of looking at keeping workers safe around some of the medium and, and low voltage um, uh, switchboards, because we were seeing incidences in, in large industrial facilities. But that's kind of permeated the whole industry. And we, we try to make sure that no matter where we are, that the workers that are working around these energized equipment locations are going to be safe. The battery energy storage space in particular is challenging because they are never really off. So sometimes with a, with a facility, if something's very dangerous, you can shut it off, work on it while it's de-energized and then bring it back up. But these batteries always have a state of charge. So when it comes to the DC systems of these battery energy storage systems, you know, it can be a challenge. So, uh, so what is arc flash? Um, it's a, it's a fault and it can depend very greatly between locations. So uh, say may, most of us have maybe seen when we flip a breaker in our home, we can see a small electrical arc in that breaker. Um, you know, for us that were maybe unfortunate enough to cross the wires in our house, sometimes we'll see a spark and maybe uh, a little bit of soot from where that electrical arc is. Uh, but when it comes to industrial applications, electrical arcs can be greatly bigger. Uh, you can see from our picture here, kind of an example of an arc flash. It's, it, can, it can be um, described as a fireball or a very large, intense amount of heat, uh, intense amount of light. And that may also include like a pressure wave and things of that nature. So it can be very dangerous if you're right in front of the location. And the real thing that we're trying to protect against is if a worker is working directly on energized electrical equipment, for example, racking in a breaker, which happens every day at a lot of, a lot of large industrial facilities, generation facilities, and things like that, um, that if there is a arc from uh, maybe a loose conductor, um, uh, sometimes we'll see like animals that are, that are living inside like switch gear that are spooked the minute you open the door and, and go to make a change and move things that they can cause that arc and then people can get injured. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, perform engineering calculations to really determine what areas are at high risk, what areas are minimal risk, so then workers can wear appropriate gear in the areas uh, where that's needed. And how we determine those areas is through this, uh, through standard. So the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, develop standards across the industries for all sorts of things. And in particular, they have very good standards developed for the calculation of arc flash. This arc flash calculation is based on empirical data. So laboratory testing of different arrangements and sizes of equipment, different fault currents, different clearing times to, uh, to map equations that we can reliably use to determine the arc flash risk and potential at different areas. Uh, the one thing I'll mention too, when it comes to arc flash, um, it's, there's a lot of small things that nuance the results. However, uh, for, the, for the main part, arc flash is controlled by current squared times time. So the more fault current you have, generally the higher the arc flash risk. Um, also, the longer it takes to clear faults, which is going to be based on the protective equipment upstream, uh, generally the higher the arc flash risk is as well. So talking a little bit about why the battery energy storage arc flash is a little bit different. Well, um, we're trying to 
do some things with battery energy storage that have, has never really been traditionally done until recently. So battery energy storage historically 10, 20, 30 years ago would be, you know, battery backup systems in case of outages. Sometimes you'll see this in like electrical substations. So if there's a power outage, you can rely on battery backup to keep protection relays, you know, maybe lighting and things like that up. Emergency lighting systems in most industrial facilities use, you know, a form of battery energy storage. Traditionally, that was based on smaller scale uh, lead acid battery technology. But what we're trying to do now is we're trying to store renewable power in large battery uh, uh, storage systems. These storage systems are on a much grander scale than anything done previously and can have battery energy dens densities of megawatt size levels. So uh, we have active projects that are 30, 40, 50, 100 megawatt capable at a time. So we're talking about um, output levels that are similar to large power plants. And to do that, these lithium ion batteries uh, are able to store uh, very high energy density. So we're, we're talking about um, very, very high amounts of energy power um, that's available here. And that's, that can be kind of shown in terms of voltage and current. So in reasonable voltages, we're seeing currents that can be very, very, very high. And you know, we just talked about it a second ago that I squared T function is what generally drives our class. So by having currents that can exceed uh, 100,000 amps, we're seeing incredible arc flash levels. So you know, that, that is one of the main challenges is we're seeing very, very, very high uh, uh, currents in the DC systems. And because we're trying to get to this high energy density level for this renewable grid, really what we're talking about is that you're gonna have large groups of batteries behind inverters, but you're not trying to buy hundreds or um, uh, maybe thousands of inverters. You're really trying to focus it on large central inverter designs with relatively large energy uh, behind them, right? So that's, that's kind of a cost saving measure and you get better technology if you use a more advanced single unit than maybe less advanced smaller units. So, you know, that is a challenge is, is trying to make this arc flash work when we have such energy density behind them. Um, other thoughts too, if we're using a central design, we still have to get that power from the inverter to the grid. Uh, generally that's done through a conversion transformer. Most of the inverter technologies out there are converting to a relatively low voltage AC signal uh, with, a, with a fair amount of current behind it. So we may have a six or 800 volt AC um, terminal that will transform up to a medium or high voltage level. Generally, we're seeing a lot of applications now that are going to the, the standard renewable 34.5 medium voltage level before it goes to transmission. But we're seeing relatively large transformers for this. And when we have these large transformers inherently right there at the AC connection of the inverter terminals, we're seeing very high arc flash risk as well. And we're seeing arc flash levels that can exceed 50 cals. Um, just for, for, uh, for those that maybe don't know, kind of 40 cals is the maximum uh, level of arc flash that anybody would want to be around. And generally that's going to require some of those big, heavy rubber arc flash suits. They did do make some equipment that, that works at higher levels than even that. However, there's other risks at those levels that the, the suits don't necessarily protect you from. Generally, those suits are looking for burn protection, but you're going to have intense pressure wave and shrapnel and things like that that would happen if an incident happened at that level. So uh, again, it can be very dangerous. So we want to identify those areas to try to uh, keep workers informed so they can take appropriate measures. Um, one of the things too is when they, when these BESS uh, large transformers, these are the AC transformers they're sized. Generally, they're going to come with, uh, they're usually, we're seeing a lot of applications where they're outdoors, they're kind of a boxed pad mount. Uh, they come with built in fuses. Fuses are sized by the manufacturers, the transformer manufacturers themselves. And those fuses are sized really kind of thinking for the protection of the equipment, not necessarily the arc flash. So what we're seeing is, you know, these fuses do really well to allow transformer inrush. Uh, it do, they do really well for protecting the windings for interior transformer faults and the things that uh, we really want to make sure the equipment's protected for. But we're finding pretty poor arc flash performance there. And just kind of uh, to summarize, 
on, on the battery energy storage, the, the once the batteries are installed, they're never at a zero state of charge, not with lithium ion technology. So this kind of goes, and this is a, a inherent part of lithium ion technology that applies to all applications. So even your, your battery in your cell phone, which is typically lithium ion, you'll notice that you can run your phone down to 1% and it still works just the same as if it's at 99%. Well, lithium ion batteries kind of work on just the very top end of their, their charge. They actually have a lot of energy density behind that, but they if you ever run your battery below its zero level, um, it never quite recovers all the way to 100% again. So the way the technology works is there's a lot of energy density behind uh, you know, the state of charge that we're trying to actually use. Um, but if, and what that means is if there was a fault, even if your battery's at near, near depleted state of charge, there's still a fair amount of fault current ready for you. And that arc flash can still be significant even if the batteries are nearly fully discharged with lithium ion technology in particular. So even though lithium ion technology is the preferred technology, there are some arc flash risks there because they're never fully de-energized. The other thought too is sometimes with battery energy storage, uh, space is a consideration. These batteries may be in containers. If workers are inside the container for whatever reason, it could be during construction, it could be for maintenance, there's limited mobility and it may be very difficult to escape faults if they happen. Um, most of the IEEE guide is based on the idea that if there is a fault, that most workers are gonna have the ability to flee the fault and, and escape the, the fault location within two seconds or less. Well, that may not be possible depending on some of the applications. So we have to anticipate that. And uh, the other thing too is with battery energy storage, we're talking about situations that we've never really encountered before in our industry. We're doing new things and sometimes new things require new equipment. So we'll talk a little bit that at, uh, later in the conversation here. So just talking a little bit about how, um, how we calculate this. So I mentioned that IEEE 1584 is the main guide for calculating arc flash, and that's true. Um, specifically for arc flash of medium and low voltage uh, areas. Sometimes, however, uh, we can use other calculation methods for medium voltage arc flash. So there's not as much empirical data for medium voltage arc flash calculation. Um, the IEEE guide tends to go very conservative and recommend the lead method, which tends to be you know, very conservative compared to other calculation methods for medium voltage arc flash. Uh, there are other methods. We're not going to get into you know, a ton of detail here. Just want to kind of state that we're aware of the, the common industry practices for calculation of medium voltage arc flash. If you employ them um, um, as, uh, as appropriate, depending on the application. Uh, talking a little bit about uh, DC calculation methods, um, and this is where we're kind of getting into more of the challenges with battery energy storage. Uh, we have uh, steady state equations that are available through the NFPE 70E uh, guide. We also have the ability to provide transient DC circuit calculations uh, using ENTP RV. So these are the ENTP RV is a um, is a transient. Uh, engineering software that is used to, to calculate DC faults. And we can look at DC faults in the time domain. So we can look at the, the DC fault current rise as opposed to the circuit characteristics, you know, talking about the capacitance and the inductance of the circuits and, and how that comes into play. So I don't like to have a talk without talking about something real. Um, I'm going to showcase here a project that, um, that we worked on with some of our partners uh, that we did in West Texas. Um, so this, this battery is situated with a large solar facility. So 500 megawatt solar facility connected with a 40 megawatt two hour battery. And the idea behind this battery is that, uh, especially if anybody's familiar with West Texas, there's a, there's a ton of renewables in the North and the West, the desert region. But most of the load in Texas, which is its own independent grid, and not a lot of power shared between the rest of the country, uh, most of Texas load is coastal or, or more towards the uh, central part of the state. So uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, um, you know, down to Corpus Christi and the coast and Houston is where a lot of the load is. So there's challenges moving that much power, the renewable power from the northwest down to the southeast. And um, so it's very advantageous for a lot of renewables there to be thinking about battery energy storage. So 
maybe some of their capability can be used um, for charging batteries when there's transmission constraints during the, the peak of the solar hours, and then maybe discharging that those batteries in the late afternoon when there's still a lot of load, but there's not a lot of renewables available. So this is a large project. This is transmission connected. Uh, this is, you know, 40 megawatts. Again, talking about the scale of batteries, you know, 40 megawatts is the size of, you know, a small power plant. You know, this is incredible amounts of energy that we're looking to store uh, and then turn around and move. Um, these lithium ion batteries have very high efficiency, you know, somewhere in the order of uh, 92 to 95% round trip efficiency, depending on the application and the technology. So, you know, there's very little losses, at least from the, you know, the, the, the battery side, you know, by using lithium ion. So there's a lot of advantages to doing this from like a high level, but it causes some art flash challenges. So one of the things that uh, we were seeing here in this particular application was some of the DC fault currents were incredibly high. So we're seeing DC fault currents at the inverter that exceeded 173,000 amps. And just to give us some perspective, like, is that a lot? Is that a little? Um, so if you talk about large industrial customers with very large transformers, you know, feeding um, a process, maybe a paper mill, you know, maybe uh, uh, somebody that's developing uh, um, um, semiconductors or silicon, somebody that has very large power requirements. And an AC world, you know, even at low voltage, it's, it's rare that you see fault currents that are over 50,000 amps. And maybe even more rare when you see them over like say 60 or 70 or 80,000 amps. And we're seeing levels here that are, you know, that are, you know, two to three times higher than the maximum that we ever see in the AC world. And on the DC side, uh, we don't have the benefit of a uh, um, of an oscillating waveform. So in the AC side, if we have a fault, even if it's a very high fault current, we know that there's going to be zero crossings of that fault current that happened uh, on that 60 hertz signal in America, in 50 hertz other word, uh, otherwise in, uh, in Europe. In the DC world, we don't have, you know, that fault current uh, rises and it, it'll stay there as a, as a direct current. So we don't have that benefit of, of crossings. Because of that, we're not seeing any breakers in any of these DC systems. Uh, so all we're seeing right now is uh, uh, is fuses, and uh, and that's okay because fuses can be very quick, right? Um, but we need to make sure that we understand what's going on there that the fuses are rated for this level of fault current. Um, and then we're talking. This is the maximum in the circuit. This is right at the inverter terminals. We also see fault currents that are very high in other places of the DC circuit. And we're gonna investigate that here in just a moment. So at the combiner fuses, so a combiner is where it takes a number of the battery stacks and brings them into one central location. Generally, we put large fuses here uh, on these, these disconnect uh, collection points. And we're seeing at the combiners, these fuses are seeing up to 87,000 amps. And at the strings, strings are basically the stacks of batteries that come to, they put batteries in series here to get to a desired maximum DC voltage. And we call that a battery string. At the tops of those battery strings, we're seeing fault currents that exceed 86,000 amps. So we, we know that we have these high DC fault currents. Uh, we're trying to find a way to help our customers solve this problem. So what can we do? You know, what, what tools do we have here? Uh, well, a couple of things that we can do is we can look at, um, maybe even before the designs are complete, before all the equipment's ordered, you know, maybe we can do some, some rough calculations. Okay, we know that we're looking to use this technology. We know that we want to buy this many battery stacks per inverter. We want to go with these inverters. If we put all this together, or maybe this isn't final, but maybe we can look at it in a preliminary way can we just kind of do a quick calculation and just look to see where, you know, we're seeing our fault currents at, and then just make sure that we order equipment that's that's appropriately sized. And it seems like a no brainer, but sometimes these, these fault currents and these studies can actually educate what equipment needs to be used. So maybe we're leaning one way because of cost for a certain fuse, but we have to go a different way because we need the rating. Uh, but it's a lot better to do it early than to do it later. Uh, another thing too is sometimes equipment is rated conservatively. 
you know, and uh, we know that we're going to need a higher rating than what's on this nameplate. Uh, we can go to the equipment manufacturer and explain their situation, and maybe their equipment rating is based on something that is more conservative than our application, so we can get them to write us a letter. So in one case, we had a fuse that was rated at a lower uh, fault current, but by looking into the details of our circuit, um, especially the uh, the elevor R ratings, and we'll get into that a little bit later, um, because our DC rise was so fast, they're like they they certified that their equipment would work in that application. Uh, another thought is maybe there's ways to reduce fault current a little bit. So especially if we're right on the right on the edge of where we need to be for fault current, maybe there's some changes to our design, uh, adding a little bit of impedance, changing the DC circuit characteristics slightly that can help us uh, uh, knock that fault current down a little bit. And then lastly. If not, none of the above work, these are kind of the easiest things to start with first, maybe the least expensive things to start with first. Then we can look into the transient performance. So DC transient studies can be expensive because uh, we're gonna have to get into higher levels of detail than we typically do when we look at uh, bulk current studies. But sometimes what we can find is um, that the DC rise is just ever so much slower than some of these, these fast acting fuses and we can get uh, desired uh, current limiting performance out of fuses. However, each battery energy storage situation, each DC circuit is unique and has to be studied independently. So uh, pictures, designs, real, real sites. So this is that West Texas uh, battery that we're talking about. And this is, uh, this isn't the entire battery. The batteries are made of modular connections. So we may have multiple inverters and multiple sets of batteries, but usually they're replicated. So this is an example of the worst case um, DC circuit that we had at this facility. And what we're seeing again, just like we talked about earlier is incredible amounts of fault current at the inverter bus. That's the culmination of all of these parallel batteries that are feeding into this fault. And this is including all the DC circuit characteristics. And when we call it this fault current, this is a perspective fault current. So this is what the fault current would be if no fault clearing devices were to operate before the current maximums are reached. So that's what we call a perspective. Um, it may be less than this. If the fuses uh, see this fault current uh, and trip and blow before this fault current is realized. But um, while saying that, these fault currents develop very quickly. So generally we'll see, you know, from minimum to maximum fault current develop in the millisecond range, you know, sometimes the microsecond range. So from the inception of the fault to the maximum fault current that's developed may happen over the course of one or two milliseconds. So we're still talking about things that are very fast, you know, maybe as fast as your eyes can blink, it gets there. So um, we also talked about some of the other areas, right? We talked about the combiner fuses, uh, the combiners are these buses where all the different battery strings are combined into larger cables that will run to the inverters, which are usually a uh, slight distance away. And we're seeing that those combiners have fuses in them. And those combiner fuses, we're seeing 87 kA. Now you'll see that the combiners themselves are exposed to almost the entire fault current. But what we're talking about is what current would flow through the fuse, because the fault would have to either be on the inverter side or the battery side of that fuse, one or the other. And we're talking about the worst case scenario. Same thing for the string um, uh, boxes themselves. So once we get to the battery stack itself, we're seeing that the, uh, uh, the fault current uh, is going to be more at the battery uh, string box. However, the, the fuse itself can only see fl uh, current flow in one direction or the other. So we look at the worst case current fault current that the battery uh, string would see, which would be on the battery side here at 86 kA. So this is just kind of representation using our steady state program. In this case, this is the ETAP uh, program. Just kind of a quick look at what's going on here uh, to talk about perspective fault currents. So again, talking about ways that we can uh, mitigate this, we kind of touched on it earlier. So if we know that we have very high DC fault currents, how do we, how do we get around this? How do we fix this? So one way that we can talk about doing that is using faster fuses. So there are some very unique fuses that manufacturers have developed here recently, specifically for applications like ours. 
that operate incredibly quickly. Uh, and by doing so, we're able to uh, uh, maybe beat that perspective fault current. So if we can have a fuse that operates faster than the fault current develops, then we can actually limit that fault current. Um, we use this in the AC world all the time with current limiting fuses, but in the AC world, we have relatively defined current rise times based on our 60 Hertz system. On DC circuits, it's completely dependent on the, uh, the LRC of the, of the circuit, the inductance, uh, resistance, and capacitance of the circuit. So that has to be studied and that requires that DC transient analysis. Uh, other options would be looking at uh, possibly longer cables. So if we add more impedance to the system, it's going to help reduce our total fault currents. However, by adding longer cables and more impedance to the system, we're adding system losses. So we're, we're losing a little bit in our round trip efficiencies because you know, we're gonna have heat losses. Uh, we're adding cost to the project. Uh, there's logistical issues where we put all this extra cable. Um, but maybe other ideas is maybe when we have these containers, not all the battery cables are the same length. There tends to be shorter cables and longer cables, depending on physically where the batteries are situated and where the, the cables from the battery containers leave to go to the combiners. Maybe the combiners are built into the cabinets. Uh, maybe making the cables more uniform. So maybe we take the shorter cables and make them the length of the longer cables. Uh, sometimes we can have some, some nice uh, fault current reductions there because you know, we tend to look for the worst case scenario when we're talking about equipment ratings. But if we can make the, the, the worst case scenario the same as maybe the, the, uh, the best case scenario, maybe we can you know, knock this down by 10% and that's what we need to get through. Uh, so there's some other thoughts that we can make too is uh, these challenges tend to arise because we are working at relatively lower DC voltages. So if we're able to raise our DC voltages, uh, maybe even double our DC voltage, say our DC voltage is 800 volts DC, if we can take it up around 1500 volts DC, we can actually see a, a pretty drastic improvement on fault current because we're getting the same energy density with half the current. Another thought is by moving away from the central inverter design, put less batteries behind a single inverter and have more inverters, we're able to knock the, uh, the total fault current down because we have less batteries contributing to this DC fault current. Uh, again, there's some challenges there because generally when we go with more inverters, we're adding project cost and we're getting less sophisticated equipment. Uh, the inverter manufacturers tend to have more features and more capability in a larger uh, single offering than multiple offerings on, you know, of similar technology. So uh, we're going to kind of start talking about protective devices a little bit. We've kind of discussed the fault currents. We kind of know where those are right now. Uh, we know where they're at. So let's talk about, you know, what can, we can do on the fuse side here uh, to help us. So for AC fuses, you know, things that we're probably used to seeing in industrial applications, you know, maybe even in your house, if you have a fuse disconnect, um, they tend to be, you know, relatively slow compared to DC fuses. Generally, your time constants on any kind of AC fuse is going to be somewhere in the area of 10 to 15 milliseconds. And it's kind of based on our 60 hertz AC system, 50 to 60 hertz. It's going to be something similar to that. For DC fuses, they generally have to be much, much faster. We're going to see the, the fault current rise times of DC circuits generally uh, if not 10 times faster, maybe uh, 20 times faster than an AC um, uh, fault current rise time. So we need to have fuses that operate equally as quickly. So we're seeing a lot of DC fuses sometimes are in the microsecond operation time. And even for very large size fuses, we're seeing this. So we may see a time constant somewhere in 0 0.5 milliseconds, which is 500 microseconds, you know, somewhere in that, in that, uh, in that perspective. So I have an example over here of another of a device here about some of the things that um, is available out there. So they have fuses here in this uh, fuse disconnect uh, with a L over R, that's its time constant of 0 0.5 milliseconds. That's that 500 microseconds we're talking about with a max perspective fault current clearing of almost half a million amps. So some manufacturers are really going after making sure that we have uh, appropriate equipment ratings here. 
So um, just to be clear, um, Commonwealth Associates is an engineering company. Uh, we're a consultant to the, uh, the power systems and, um, and our clients. We don't have any affiliation with fuse manufacturers or equipment manufacturers of any type. Uh, but I just want to talk about some of the things that we found. So these are some of the equipment that are out there that are being used in battery energy storage systems. So, you know, if you're looking to develop a battery energy storage system, these may be some of the places you start. Um, there are other manufacturers out there that are doing things as well. Uh, and we tend to find new equipment being manufactured all the time. But these are some of the things that we work with. So I just figured we'd mention it here. Uh, and the whole reason I'm talking about this is really to talk about what our ratings are. So we're seeing that, you know, the ratings can vary greatly. So we're seeing some fuses have fuses with a rating of a quarter million amps. Wow, this is pretty great, right? Um, we see some equipment that's maybe only got a rating of 85 uh, KA. We're seeing a lot of equipment that's even only rated at 50,000 amps. So um, I just want to make sure that, you know, everyone kind of knows that that the ratings can kind of be all over the place. And it really de depends on who you're working with, what, what manufacturer and what they've developed. So here we can talk about four different manufacturers that all have different offerings. Some can be very, very uh, high performance. Uh, some maybe not quite as well, but there's different applications that drive this. So maybe this, this high performance fuse is very, very large. Maybe it physically doesn't fit in the application that we have, right? So then we have to look to other devices to, to fit. Um, there may be voltage concerns. Maybe we're operating our, our system at 1500 volts. So a 1200 volt fuse isn't gonna be sufficient. So just some of the things out there that I figured we'd, uh, we'd touch on and mention. So uh, just a little bit of a talk on current limited devices and we've kind of touched on this earlier. I just wanna kind of give a scale for what the difference is between a an AC um, current rise might look like and what a DC current rise might look like and also how a current limiting fuse works. So this is a really nice graphic that we got from Little Fuse. And in this graphic, um, we can kind of see how a current limiting fuse in an AC system would work. Is that, you know, before that, that perspective peak current were to occur, that fuse is going to start to burn and that, that fuse will completely burn and have total fault clearing before the perspective fault currents reach. And as that fuse burns, its impedance starts to us um, to go greatly up until it becomes an infinite as that fuse is burning. Um, and this all works really well. The nice thing about current limiting fuses, this is a known quantity. You can buy them in the AC world from most fuse manufacturers. They have graphs and charts that'll tell you exactly uh, how much they'll knock down fault currents at different voltage levels and applications. So it's relatively straightforward to buy a current limiting fuse. And why would we wanna do that? Well, say we have a strong system that we're connecting to, but we don't wanna buy a bunch of expensive high rated short circuit gear. Uh, it's quite possible we can put current limiting fuses in um, uh, on our radial system and it would protect downstream equipment. You know, So say we could buy a 10,000 uh, amp short circuit piece of uh, electrical equipment, like say a transformer, uh, electrical panel or electrical panel breakers as opposed to having to buy a 30,000 amp uh, similar equipment because we put these fuses in I mean, from an AC perspective. On the DC perspective, however, we can't use these charts because each DC circuit is going to be unique. So I just wanna give some perspective too. If you'll see there's a red line here and it's a little faint, I apologize for that, but uh, this red line respects uh, is showing a 500 microsecond uh, current rise compared to a typical 10 millisecond current rise in the AC system. So we can see how DC fault currents can be very, very fast developing. And that can be a challenge because if we had a fuse that was approximately as fast as the one that was used in this AC application, it would never have a chance to burn before the total perspective fault current hits it. And, uh, and we would find that the fuse would have zero uh, fault current limiting capability. So, uh, again, things, things can be challenging here. And in uh, this slide here is another one. This is from uh, Busman. Uh, this is a really nice uh, example of how you can use some of their tables and graphs on the AC world to size these, these uh, current limiting fuses. However, in the DC world, transient uh, analysis is gonna be required to, to really determine what's going on here and whether the DC fuses are going to be fast enough. So what happens is it's just a race. It's a race between 
the fault current developing in the DC circuit versus how fast the fuse can see that current and, and trip that current out. So uh, we talked a bit about transient analysis. So here I'm showing you some output from our EMTP RV program. So this program allows us to model the DC circuit uh, down to a time domain level. So we can find out when we, when we start with a fall at fall inception, how fast does this DC rise happen? And then if this DC rise happens, can we model the protective devices that we've selected uh, to see whether they're gonna be current limiting or not? And the answer isn't always that they're gonna be current limiting. We've seen plenty of applications here where uh, when we get to the transient analysis, even after looking at it, the fuses are slow and the DC uh, current rise is faster than the fuse and there is no benefit. Uh, but in this case, we are able to see some benefits. So we have a very high speed fuse. This was the Sino fuse uh, RS-306 that we're studying. And we modeled the DC circuit. This is that same 40 megawatt West Texas battery that we were talking about. And what we can see here is that our fault current is going to be limited to around 15,000 amps. Now that perspective fault current we were talking about earlier was 178,000 amps. So not only is this fuse fast, but it's fast enough to really, really give us nice performance uh, when it comes to fault current. And it has very, it turned out having very good arc flash performance. So we'll, we'll talk about that as well. And how we found that is we can look at the, uh, the fault current DC rise which is a logarithmic scale. We have this really scaled out to a really thin time, just so we can kind of see where it lands on the graph here. Um, but this is where that fuse would have total fault clearing, you know, so we can see what the maximum fault clearing time is gonna be, and we can use that into our, our arc flush calculations. So how does that help us? So, you know, we looked at different areas um, that would see some of the, the fault currents, Actually, I think I have a typo here. I'll have to fix that. But the uh, on the inverter, we are at 178,000 amps. We knocked that down to 15,000 amps. We can see that our DC fault current is going to be limited uh, severely. You know, so we're going to go from uh, a uh, a fault current of you know, an arc flash performance of around 2.61, still relatively good, but we knock it down to almost negligible levels. So things that have incredibly high fault currents that could be maybe very scary for workers to be around. Now it can be around these areas with just typical um, workplace, you know, substation PPE. And not only does it there at the worst location at the inverter, we're seeing that at other locations, the string fuse, the combiner, and we're seeing similar performance that because we know that these fuses are going to operate uh, very quickly and act as a current limiting device, we can knock our arc flash performance down. But there is one area that it doesn't really help us. And that is here in our, at the batteries themselves. So why is that? Well, when we have these batteries put together, each battery is its own source. And we may have multiple battery stacks that are operating in parallel. And what we find is if we have a fault, specifically if we have a fault on the battery side of the string fuse, that all the other string fuse uh, fuses are going to blow and trip. Now it's a lot of fuses to replace, but it will protect our workers and protect our equipment. However, the battery that is there at the fault, at the top of that battery stack, there are no protective devices between the cells themselves. And that battery will discharge 100% of its energy uh, while there's a fault there until those batteries at zero state of charge, true zero. So what happens is even though we have um, really nice arc flash performance elsewhere in the circuit. At the battery itself, we have we have pretty poor arc flash performance because we have no fast clearing time. We have no clearing time at all, to be honest. Now, this goes back to that IEEE guide we talked at the beginning of the presentation. So based on our IEEE 1584 uh, standards and our NFPA 70E standards, we can use a maximum clearing time of two seconds if there are no protective devices. And that two seconds is arbitrary. However, the thought is, is in within two seconds, a worker would be able to flee the arc flash uh, and, and get out of that way, right? And move away from it. So, you know, if, if you see a spark, you're going to, you're going to kind of react and take cover. Now that all depends is, you know, is there a way to, is there a, is a, a means of egress? Can we get away from this fault? 
So we need to be careful and think about it. So a lot of these battery containers may have the ability to, um, you, know, you may be able to access it from outside the building. Maybe there's outside doors that open. So if you're working in this area, uh, you'd be able to get away. But we need to kind of keep things in mind. Would you be on a ladder? Um, would you be inside a building? If you're inside the building, are there multiple ways to get away from a fault if there was a fault? So we got to think about it a little bit. In this case, there was enough means of egress that we're able to use that two second limit. But even at that 10, uh, almost 11 kA fault current, which is much less than some of the other fault currents. And mind you, it's an I squared T function because we're going two seconds and not the incredibly fast clearing that we had with the other um, uh, RS-306 fuses, we're seeing energy levels that are over 40 cals. And as, as we remember from earlier in the talk, anything over 40 cals can be very difficult to protect yourself with as typically those big, heavy arc flash rubber suits. So how do we how do we solve this issue? It sounds like we, we have pretty good arc flash performance now because we have these current limiting fuses, but then at the battery stacks themselves, we're kind of stuck, right? Um, you know, we have this 40 cal uh, arc flash energy. So if we're gonna work around these batteries at all, now we have to wear these, these big cumbersome suits. Uh, well, the real problem that we have here is we don't have fault clearing time. You know, our fault current isn't unre unreasonable here. Uh, but we need to find, find a way that if there is a fault in this location, it'd be the top of these battery stacks, kind of the upper left in this, uh, this particular instance. Uh, we need to find a way to remove these batteries from the circuit. And what we find is if we had these fusible links, like a lot of these batteries are connected with like hard bus bar and they're ran in series. So each battery cell may be 40 to 60 volts. But when you stack them all up, there may be, you know, 10, 13, 15 of these batteries all, all connected in series. That's how you get to your total um, DC voltage level that we're looking to operate, generally around, you know, somewhere between 600 volts, and 1500 volts DC. But there's no protective devices between each of these series cells, generally. So many, many battery manufacturers are building this way, and maybe they're doing it for cost, but um, the real thing that we need to do is we really need to be thinking about having fuses between the battery stacks themselves, the series battery stacks. Uh, in this particular instance, we looked at different fuses. Uh, you know, there's, there's different applications here, but assuming that we had reasonable performance of fuses uh, that would operate in a relatively similar time frame that we had for the Ceno fuses, uh, we would see that 40 cals drop to approximately four cals if we're able to have the uh, the fusible links between the battery stacks. So it's something that we're seeing in the industry that you know there's recommendations here that we really need to be thinking about this. And we can really greatly improve our flash performance for our workers around these batteries, which are getting larger and larger. Um, and they're, we're seeing more and more of them across the United States every day. So making sure that we have uh, thoughts to not only the, the DC circuits, that connect all the batteries in parallel, but also the batteries themselves that we're buying from the battery manufacturers that they're taking this into account and giving us good uh, R flash performance. All right, with that, that makes the, that's the entirety of my presentation here. And I appreciate your time today. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll step back and answer any questions you have. I have a general question about arc flash. Uh, DC arc flash. Is DC arc flash different than AC arc flash? Is the hazard greater? Is the explosion different? So uh, would it be different? I mean, really, we're talking about an electrical arc. Yeah. An electrical arc of a certain amount of energy. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you ever watch, say, a video online of what, a, what an AC arc flash looks and sounds like, you can actually see and kind of hear the chatter of the, the fault current cycles as it happens. So it's not just boom or, you know, whap. It's uh, you're, you're hearing kind of like a vibration of the 60 hertz signal hitting. So as many cycles as that arc persists, you're, you're seeing the pulses. Uh, with a DC, you don't get pulses. You just get all of it. There is no cycling of that fault current, right? It's all right now. Um, so... In reality, the arc flash would be like it would be a little bit different as, as how it presents, but the results are the same. We're talking about devastating amounts of energy, heat. Um, what happens with these arc flashes is it's enough energy 
well, uh, I'll put it a different way. Electrical arc is six times hotter than the surface of the sun. It's incredibly hot at the point of the electrical arc. And we're talking about arcs of such magnitude and heat that it will vaporize copper very quickly. And if you take a solid and make it a vapor, uh, you're gonna have a, uh, an incredible increase in pressure in that area. And that pressure is gonna be directed in the path of least resistance generally towards the worker because they have a cabinet door open and all the other doors in that cabinet are gonna direct that force out to them. So it's, uh, that's why these are so scary is, is basically you have an electrical arc, which itself maybe isn't so scary because we've seen it, you know, maybe when you're plugging something in, you get a little electric spark, but of such magnitude um, that it's, it's like an explosion going off in your face. So, you know, practically uh, an AC and a, a DC electrical arc are going to have the same results. You know, it's still going to be very um, dangerous to workers, whether we have it in a, in a DC application or an AC application, it'll present itself slightly differently. But, uh, but the risk is still real on both sides of it. Okay, uh, in, um, in some medium voltage uh, breakers, high voltage breakers, they have sh arc chutes at the top. In mm -hmm. these, um, in these uh, storage facilities, these storage cabinets for lithium ion batteries, because they're all condensed and so close together, um, is it possible to shoot or vent the arc flash from the top of the container to lessen the forward motion of the arc flash explosion. It's, that's a really good point, and you're absolutely right. So there's a lot of AC gear that's built this way that kind of have this arc shoot technology where they can redirect the arc flash somewhere away from the worker. At the very least, you would lessen the impact. We talked about that a second ago. Was with an open cabinet door, all that force is coming to you. Maybe you can lessen that force by allowing some of it to rise. So in, in a lot of the battery cabinets that we're familiar with, and we've done a lot of battery uh, projects so far, um, lithium ion batteries for normal operation get really, really hot. So as you charge and discharge those batteries, heat management is a big part of their design. And what you find is these batteries are surrounded by um, lots of fans in the cabinets. The cabinets themselves tend to be vented uh, just about everywhere. And um, the AC systems, the battery containers are, are quite extensive and, and quite large. So what, we're, what we find is for a typical AC electrical gear, you don't have this heating and cooling effect that has to be engineered and, and uh, managed. You know, generally the stuff is in a temperature controlled environment. It tends to be, um, you're not moving air in, in inside and around those cabinets. It's not really needed. Uh, but in the, on these batteries, it is. So ideas like venting and things like that uh, generally don't really work because if you had an arc flash chute, you really wouldn't be able to uh, cool and maintain the battery temperatures that are required just to maintain the warranties and the, and the technology itself. So uh, it is an interesting thought. Uh, it's not something that we've really seen much development on, mostly because of the, uh, the heating and cooling requirements associated with the batteries. Okay, <clears throat> here's a question. Um, how, is the, how is fault current measured and how, how is the protection operated on the DC side? Sure. Um, so when we talk about measuring fault current, there's, there's all sorts of mean, means of measuring current. Typically in our AC world, we would do that with a current transformer because you can't measure 170,000 amps, uh, but you could run it through a, a current transformer and convert that to a lesser current and then measure that, that amount. That's typically how we do it with, with AC systems. Uh, in DC systems, especially for the DC uh, experiments that looked at this, I imagine that they're doing something very similar. Um, but when it comes to DC systems, there are no relays and there are no breakers, it's all fuses. So as far as how the protection is operated, um, every single DC, circuit that we're seeing is a DC fuse protected circuit. So, uh, and then we get it into how fuses work. So fuses have a, a design that as current increases, there's different materials that they use that start to melt and uh, deform at, at different currents and temperatures. And then the, the, the fuse will burn up, right? So that's basically how the, the protection is operated. 
But as far as like say the empirical uh, formulas, the NFPA analysis that was done for, for DC arc flash, I imagine that they're probably measuring their DC currents for the experimental arc flashes using current transformers and, and measurement devices accordingly. Okay, thanks for that answer. He, uh, next question, is this issue primarily for lithium ion batteries or do other battery sources in battery electric storage system applications have the same high arc flash levels? Um, so, yeah, uh, we see DC arc flash can be a concern at, for any battery storage. Um, typically, like if you look at maybe substation or power plant, electrical room battery backup, which may be a lead acid technology and not a lithium ion technology, there's still gonna be an arc flash concern there. Um, and it's just gonna depend on uh, the fault current and the fuses that are used. So you, I'm not, I'm not gonna say that arc flash is not a concern in other areas. Um, however, because the technology is a little bit different, you don't have as much energy density and you're generally not gonna have as many lead acid batteries um, as you would for one of these battery energy storage sites, mostly because the energy density is much, much less. Uh, you're generally not gonna see as high in fault currents. So I, I would say it's definitely gonna be application specific, but in general, I would, I would say that other technologies won't have as severe um, uh, considerations as what we'll see with lithium ion. All right, okay. Because these lithium ion batteries, uh, many people refer to them as bombs. Well, there, there there's are, a lot of there's a lot of explosive energy in a lithium ion battery compared to a another traditional battery. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So lithium ion batteries have higher energy density, right? Than than any other. Well, there's always new technology coming out, but in general, it's our most uh, most energy dense battery technology that's widely available. So, you know, that is, that's what, you know, so there's a lot of energy in that, in that battery, right? And then mm -hmm. you some of the traditional challenges with lithium ion, I mean, thermal runaway has been a known issue with lithium ion for quite some time, right? And we didn't really talk about that so much here. Uh, thermal runaway is a different issue than an arc flash. Generally it's much slower developing. However, a thermal runaway uh, may be the precursor to an arc flash event, right? So, in particular, we're looking at the events where all that energy comes out all at once, and it can be very devastating to workers. You know, the thermal runaway tends to be that you you have breakdowns inside the battery containment, inside its uh, uh, its casings and things like that. That'll that'll you know maybe eventually end in a fault, uh, but it tends to be a little bit slower developing. And the arc flash in that particular instance uh, may be less. Right. So, how big is the risk of thermal runaway? Uh, so we're talking about risk is how often that it happens. I think uh, it'd be a different probably conversation, a different presentation to get into that a little bit more. And it's not my area of expertise necessarily, but, uh, okay. you know, we're, we're quite aware that it exists. Uh, with a lot of our, so all of our battery energy storage technology sites that we've been a part of and worked with, there is extensive um, engineering and preparation to try to protect the site from, from exactly that issue. So the fire protection systems that we see in these battery containers are extensive. Um, and there's a variety of different means of how they try to extinguish uh, the thermal runaway and faults. Sometimes with the, and usually you may not be trying to protect the equipment that has the thermal runaway, usually that's a lost cause. But the idea is to protect other equipment at the site. So maybe we have one battery container that has a battery with thermal runaway. Maybe we can, we'd have to sacrifice that string but we'd be able to save the other strings, maybe even that entire container. But the idea is to limit that, that risk of that battery fire if that happens. Um, it's kind of a different discussion. Not really arc flash, but there is a lot of engineering thought that goes into uh, protecting against thermal runaway and protecting the site as an entirety against a, any kind of lithium ion related uh, uh, incident. Okay, well, Peter, Nick Peter Nicholas has a few comments. One that arc shoot has plates that elongate the arc in loops that form with magnetic repulsion, like charges repel, that cools it and extinguishes it. That's how the arc shoot works. And also he says the thermal runaway of lithium ion batteries is being reduced by engineering. Take mm -hmm. seconds instead of cycles. Right. Yeah, I would agree with uh, both of those points. There's some very nice new technology that's coming out that should help us 
And uh, we very much look forward to implementing that new technology in our designs. Great. Okay, that's it for the questions. Thank you very much, Ian.